Hello everybody and welcome. I'm Dawn Campbell, your host, and um, this is another CPD and business building webinar from the IAPCM, but with a difference because this time it's about our book. So we're joined today by Adele, who's in the hot eat, and she's going to be bringing her chapter to life. Now, as you know, we've had a series of calls, the seven authors, the magnificent seven, as I like to refer to them, who wrote the book, um, how to keep, or how to win rather, how to win and keep clients. So Adele uh, is our professional head of standards. She's also extremely uh, busy social worker in the mental health profession and working hard because of the NHS and um, co-author of this magnificent book. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Adele, who's going to bring the, the chapter to life and you're going to learn lots. So grab your pad and pen. Enjoy. <laughs> Hi everyone and um, lovely to be here with you all um, to talk to you about my chapter um, and it, it, it's aptly named A plus V times T equals clients and this was my formula for winning and keeping clients and for me this was about the three most important characteristics that I think in terms of building a sustainable business um, going forwards and I think that's the, the most important bit is about making your business sustainable um, so it's easy it, it might feel easy to get clients but how do you keep them and that that's the key to the success so there's the three main um, bits for me um, and if I could just find that there we go so there's three characteristics for success so to win clients you need to be authentic okay and that may seem quite a straightforward thing and I'll talk to you specifically about what that means um, as we go through to be authentic you need to be have clear values and to understand um, what your values are now it's very easy when we, we when we're coaching people one of the first things that we might do is actually go and, and, and understand their values but it's really important when you're building your business is to be very very clear about what your values are um, because certainly when you're uh, coaching within the workplace if, if you're doing that that a lot of the conflict can happen within a workplace when values don't align so it's really important when you're building that rapport with your um, clients that your values and their values align and that you and that you um, and that so that you're able to build the best rapport for that business. To keep the clients, they need to trust you. And, um, and I know these things seem like very, very straightforward things. But from my experience, when I was um, setting up my business, I spent a lot of time just going uh, on marketing courses for this and a marketing course for that. But actually what I didn't apply to my business in the first instance was the things that I find important um, if I'm going to be part parting with my hard-earned money so I think these are the things that I really learned that were the key for building my um, business and making it sustainable so the first bit the authenticity there's a great quote here it just really really sort of um, explains it which is about having the alignment of your head your mouth your heart and feet making sure that you're thinking you're saying and you're feeling are doing the same thing consistently this helps build your trust and followers love leaders that they can trust and i really really love that quote because one of the one of the great things that i found when i was sort of writing this chapter and looking back on some of the mistakes that i'd made is that actually some of my early marketing was in conflict with what i really really thought and some of the marketing i did i didn't feel connected with i didn't feel attached to um, and so this was really really important to think about how everything about me needs to align because when things align you the marketing of your business um, just becomes effortless. When you're having to work too hard at it, it might mean that there's something that's not quite right. So my first, my first lesson really is about having a look at your marketing or how how you've um, you're promoting your business and have a look at that and ask yourself the question: Would I invest in my own services based on my adverts? And when I look back at my very first um, uh, drafts of my website, and my website is very lovely in that it saves every version that I have. So I was able to go back and look at what I had at the beginning. And I thought, 
I wouldn't have gone near my website with a barge pole. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have booked me if I were me because it was boring. It was dull. <laughs> um, and I just thought, where did, where was I popping? Where was I standing out from the crowd when I looked at this? It was, it was dull. It was the same language that you see time and time again on other people's um, sites. And I just thought, what am I, what do I need to have done to make me stand out from everybody else? So I have really sat there and thought about um, what did I need to do differently? So I think one of the real important things to do is pay attention to your own experiences. So when you are looking at things on the internet and, and you know, and given that the stage that we're in, that we're, um, every, a lot of things are digital now. So sales are digital, communications digital because of um, coronavirus. Um, and the, the challenges that we have with that. But when you're having a look and you're having a browse on the internet, have a think about what first draws you in. And this is, a, there's, there's also really good, but you can do this on LinkedIn. It's a really, really easy exercise. But first, what has first drawn you in about that particular person's profile um, or the website? What colors do you see? Is there something within the branding and the colors that you feel are resonating to you? What language do you connect with? So what, how are they describing things that you feel, yes, I get that, that I really understand that, that sort of really links in with me. And how does it make me feel? So, you know, what do I feel when I look at this particular website? You know, does it make me feel energized? Does it make me feel happy? Is that kind of what I need in, in my life at this moment? And they have a think about what values do you think that company has? So on their website, that's draw, the, the website that's drawn you in or what, or the person on LinkedIn that's drawn you in, what do you think that their profile is saying about them, their values that you feel that you're able to connect with? And how do you know what their values are from what you've seen? How, what, what, what is it that, that they are communicating with you? And then why would you buy the product? So if there's somebody there that's selling something, why would you buy something from them? What is it that's really made you think, yes, I'm stopping in my tracks, I'm stopping the scrolling. I mean, it, you know, it's no different really to, you know, for people who are dating and they're scrolling left and they're scrolling right. What's the thing that that person connects with? And so then have a look at what does your marketing say? So what do you think people are drawn in on, on your marketing, what colors are you using and why are you using those branding colors? What language are you using to connect with them? Is it language that is very true to you as a person or is it very straightforward language that everybody else is using? And the reason why I think this is really important is because you're selling, you, you're the product. And so if you, if you, when the person meets with you and connects with you in that first session, if you're very different to your website, what, what does, they've been drawn in through one way, but they're talking to you differently. How does that, how does that match up? So that, that might be um, where you're, you're um, saying one thing and doing another and that so you want, what you want to do is make sure that the language is something that resonates with you. Ask people around you, ask them these questions when they look at your website and see what it tells, what their feedback is around this. What is it telling them about you? And is that the message that you want to be portraying? So um, in the book, if people have got a copy of the book, there's um, a little bit that I wanted to, to talk to you about in terms of um, one of my earliest iterations of the website and please don't go to sleep when I read this because <laughs> I'm trying to make the point. But it's about, I, I started, this is how I started. Are you looking to make a big life change but need the courage to do so? Have you always wanted to start your own business but never seemed to get over the first hurdle? Are you currently having to deal with a big life change and not sure which way to turn? When we are faced with adversity or challenges, it is important to understand the relationship you have with yourself. We can help you remove your blocks that are preventing you from achieving your fullest potential. Our coaching packages will be able to help. Now, for me, that... I mean, that's not really saying a great deal about who I am, how I can help you. It's just listing the same old lists 
that you will see time and time again on other people's websites. It is a narrative you could have lifted and you could put on a thousand other websites. That says nothing about me and it says nothing about the experience that that person will have when they get coached by me. The other bit is that all the way through this, I've used words like we, we can help you and our coaching packages. And what I did when I was setting this up was that I tried to make people believe that I was part of this big team because if they were part of this big team then I was going to book the high ticket clients because they would think that they were booking this big team um, and I thought at some point I'll create a team but it's really um, what I was really doing is you know having an imaginary team and hiding in the market I wasn't standing out for the crowd and actually I was sort of being a bit more apologetic about who I was as a person so it's really, really important to be yourself, be true and be proud of being you. If you're the only one in your business, then be the only one in the business and be who it is that you need to be. You don't need to be pretending that you're something else and, um, and that, you, you know, that you have to be um, corporate or, or, or whatever. And then I want to talk to you about... Um, just having that confidence so the trusting yourself to be great because you are great trusting that you have a place in the market because you will I, I think some of the scariest bits at the beginning for me were thinking about oh my god there's so many coaches the market's flooded I'm not going to get any work there's work for everybody out there you just have to trust that you have a place in that market everybody has the place in that market but you have to be yourself you have to be true and you have to be proud of being you stop comparing yourself to other people in your field I did this for, and, and it, it's, it's easy to still continue to do it but I did this right at the beginning but you have to remember they're not you and you're not them so just stick with what you know it's not, don't try and be other people or emulate other people that in the market that you feel that you want to be because you're not going to be yourself and then as soon as you pick up any clients they'll know that and then so you re it's really important because there will be people out there that will want to book you not anybody else they'll want to book you for the reasons of you are who you are um, so you really need to allow those parts of yourself to shine and I want to um, talk to you about a story, which I talk about in the book. There's a marketing duo in um, uh, the Newcastle based, and they're called Andrew and Pete. And their website is called Andrew and Pete. <laughs> and, um, and I really like that Andrew and Pete have, are very proud of being Andrew and Pete. Um, and the reason, and, and you, you sit there and think, Andrew and Pete, it doesn't have much of a ring about it in terms, of, but. The, the thing that stuck out for me was um, I was doing the daily going through Twitter thinking, oh, let me follow lots of people. Then they'll follow me back. I'll build a network because that's what some marketing people is to build your community, do all of those kind of things. And that's what I was trying to do. So anyway, what I did, I, I followed them and um, I got this automated um, direct message now I'd had hundreds of those so as soon as I'd followed some people on Twitter I'd get this message going thanks for following me on Twitter now can you follow me on LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram and I just used to scroll past them because I just thought oh god this is horrendous um, but Andrew and Pete's direct message actually started with we know this is direct message we're really sorry so in order to punish us you can either slap us around the face with a fish um, tell our mums or uh, take our tea away from us it was something ridiculous like that and to vote for how you'd like to punish us for this direct message click here and it drew me it made me laugh because I thought this is really funny so I clicked that it took me to their website where I was allowed to vote of how I wanted to punish them for sending me an automated direct message which I just thought was absolutely brilliant and I could feel I'd just been completely drawn in from an automated direct message on Twitter so you can imagine Twitter is so busy and it's so packed. How do you stand out from the crowd? They stood out from the crowd and they stood out from the crowd from being different, from being funny, from being creative. And all of those things are things that I find that are really important to me. So they drew me in. Now there'll be other people that would have looked at that and gone, oh, I'm not interested in that because that wouldn't have resonated for them, but that resonated for me. 
And then they, I just sort of started having a look on their website and then they had this free 30 minutes that you could have. And I really spent a lot of time in, with, with them that had this free 30 minutes, which they called a zombie session, which was just odd as well, but it was great. And um, they gave me their time. I learned so much in this free 30 minutes. They had this, um, they did this whole sort of uh, digital conference for a week, which we were able to join and, um, and learn lots of stuff about marketing and then I ended up actually booking a session with them um, after some months and um, to help them to get them to help me with my website and really um, what their message to me was really about how to get me into my website how to get people to understand what was important to me and who I was and the experience that I would get with those people so I'd had all of this and I ended up being a paying client of Andrew and Pete because that is what they had done they'd drawn me in and they dropped but they hadn't sold to me so they hadn't given me some big long spiel and marketing pitch they hadn't sent me a message on LinkedIn saying did I want a six-figure salary and you know high ticket clients and this is what you need to do and use this that was all just very scripted they got me in through laughter and um to be honest that uh, you know you could call me a cheap date but I think laughter just takes me you know it's, it's absolutely brilliant I, I I thought that it was so good um and this was so helpful to me um, because I stopped then trying to pretend I was part of some big coaching company. I stopped trying to pretend that I was going to be very straightforward. And actually, I started going, do you know what? I'm going to be myself and I'm going to be true to who I am. And I'm going to be proud of who I am as a person within my business. Because I think when we're, you know, as coaches and you're setting up as a business, you've got to think about what was the reason that you did that? What was the reason that you might have... Um, left an, a, a salary type job was it because you wanted a better work-life balance was it because you wanted to have a better quality of work life and actually by by just not being yourself you're just going to create the same kind of scenarios that you might have already decided to leave from from the corporate world so i i used this and i applied this so myself and uh, a, a, another coach um we decided we'd met and we both said we really wanted to run a retreat and um we were like yeah let's run a retreat i want to run a divorce retreat because i kind of had thought when when i went through a divorce i would have been really good to go on a retreat so me and her said we're gonna we're gonna run this retreat and we set up our um we found the perfect venue we were like everything was aligning this was going to be this amazing retreat that we were going to run this divorce retreat and so we plowed some money into it and we started advertising it and nothing happened we got probably two inquiries and nothing happened nobody wanted to book onto this retreat and we were going, oh, God, we were so certain that this, you know, I'd never felt so sure about anything in my life that I was going to run a retreat. This was one of those things that I just felt so certain was going to happen. And I'm like, but why is this not happening? Something's not, something's not right. And I spoke to my, we've got about a month left to go and we were having to pay the last portion of our um, deposit for the venue. Um, so it was either we pay it and then try and do something else or we lose the first part of the deposit and so it was a we were sort of on a bit of a knife edge trying to make this decision anyway i said to i had a friend of mine who was going through a messy divorce at the time and i said oh you know this divorce retreat she said to be honest adele she said i don't want to even think about my divorce she said i'd love to go on a retreat i'd love to go to a place where i can heal my heart i can heal my mind but i don't want to go on a on a retreat where I have to think about my divorce. She says, I want to get away from that. I want something fun to do. I sat there and thought, we've, we've got this completely wrong. Absolutely completely wrong. And then we looked back at, and the other thing is we were finding it really, um, we were really struggling with the marketing. We didn't quite know how to, how to make it pop. And, and like I say, because nothing was happening, it was becoming more and more hard work. But let me, let me read one of the first adverts. I mean, and it was actually quite embarrassing when I wrote this chapter to, to dredge this out of the archives and put this in print and show you was actually, for me, I was kind of like, oh gosh, I don't want anybody to have to see what we wrote, but I'm sharing it with you because I'd rather you not have to <laughs> go through the painful marketing period we went through. But here we go. So it says, 
When faced with the prospect of divorce, you will experience a myriad of emotions. This can include anger, anxiety and depression, feelings of low self-worth, relief, guilt and sadness. This divorce retreat offers a safe space for you to explore and work through the complexities of these emotions to allow you to maintain your best self during the divorce process. Now, would any of you booked on that? Because I certainly wouldn't. And I look back and I thought, oh my gosh, what have we done? What have we done? So we sort of had crisis talks and we said, scrap it. Let's get rid of it. Let's... And, and actually that language is not coaching language either. It's very kind of therapist kind of counts. It's not coaching language. And in coaching, we wanted people to achieve their goals and step forward and do things that are positive. And that was not saying anything about coaching. So we, we sat down and we, we scrapped the whole thing. We had about a month to go and we came up with the Beautiful Souls Wellness Retreat. And it sounds so much more positive. And we put that it aims to heal hearts and minds and offers you the space to breathe from stresses of life, to emerge stronger and more confident by creating a lifestyle change of self-love and positivity for personal growth and development. There will also be lots of time for fun and laughter with creative opportunities to help you express yourself in the truest form. The retreats are small so that you can relax and wind, laugh and connect with others. So for me, that sounds a lot better. And I would have, I would have absolutely paid money to go on the Beautiful Souls retreat. I wouldn't have paid it. You would have had to pay me to go on that divorce retreat. So where I, what we'd done is we'd listened to my friend and said, what is it that she wants? And she wanted to go and heal her heart and heal her mind. And we used her language in this. And we got 11 people booked on to that retreat with a month to go. 11 people came on. We had an absolute blast all of those um attendees they're all still in touch with each other we did a follow-up one day retreat we had two of the people from the first retreat they rebooked for the day retreat i've had people that have become coaching clients out of this it's been phenomenal just by changing the language and putting language in that was true to who we were so for me i'm a lot about energy and laughter and fun and um, Sarah, who I ran it with, she's very about um, uh, mindfulness and creativity. And we fused the two bits together. And the people that turned up were absolutely brilliant. We had an absolute blast with them. And it was one of the best experiences because we were like, do you know what? We've got people here that we really like working with. We really enjoy working with them. We all have, and it didn't feel like work. And if you think about like one of the, you know, probably why you wanted to come out and be coaches and set up your own business is that actually you want to have a better work experience. And that's what we had with this. And it was, it was, it was absolutely brilliant. And it was a massive gamble we took, but we felt so much happier about it. And because we were happier with it, when people rang us and made inquiries and said, oh, can you tell me about your retreat? We were like, yeah, I can, I can, because it's going to be amazing. It's going to be brilliant. And this is what's going to happen. And because we were so passionate and positive, people were like yeah I want to come I want to be on that I want to have a part of that and it just sort of sold itself without us having to do anything so um I just you know I think it's really really important that you know when however you're marketing and what you're marketing you've got to be passionate about it if your marketing is not true to who you are then you're going to really really struggle because it's going to feel like hard work so the next thing I'm going to take you on to is the, the next part of my sort of formula for winning and keeping clients. And this is about values. And, and I've kind of touched upon that a little bit when we've been going through the authenticity section. So with your values, Gandhi, very famous um, quote, your beliefs become your thoughts, your thoughts become your words, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, your habits become your values, and your values become your destiny. And one of the things that you know, I'll go back to Andrew and Pete, what they helped me do was come up with what my values were that I wanted to have for my business. And, and with those values, as I understood, as I worked out what my three main um, uh, uh, values were going to be, was actually thinking about branding lingo and using lingo that works for you. So I'll share with you my three, um, my three values, which are, and if you can see my lovely pictures, um, so we've got uh, energy, laughter and glass ceiling smasher. So, I mean, they sound, I, I don't know, um, 
<laughs> what they sound like but for me it's about being energetic and and you know I certainly if I'm if I'm doing a group session I like to have everybody up on their feet I like to inject a lot of energy into the room and allow people to bounce off each other that's how I work it's not going to suit everybody but the people that want to work with me will also will get really really enjoy that um, I think laughter um, I mean I have there is actually something I'm a laughter workshop facilitator it does it does exist but I think for me fun and laughter in in any space really sort of means that I get I, I feel like I've had a really really good day and the other bit about being a glass ceiling smasher um, this is you know other people talk about that as your limits and, and get breaking through your limits for me it's glass ceilings and this is very particular specific for me because I have felt a time in my life um, where I just felt I was at a glass ceiling and how do you break through how do you get through that and I really really want to help people that's one, one of the things I love seeing people just achieve whatever it is that they want I love to see them breaking the mold I love to hear the stories when you know people were faced with so much adversity that actually they smash through that and they you know and they prove people wrong that's what I find um, I, I'm really passionate about and if I can help people do that then you know how how wonderful um, you know just hearing the other day there's a client that I've been working with who had sort of been um, you know on her knees and sort of quite disabled um, disabled but unable to um, uh, un unable to um, come to work because she was feeling so anxious about everything um, and within a year she's back at work and she's been promoted and you know you know she's working full-time and she's been promoted and for her a year ago she would not have even considered that that was possible now she's just absolutely flying and for me that that is wonderful to see those outcomes for people that's what is important to me as a coach that's what i want to do for my clients and people who want those experiences are the people that are going to be drawn to me as a coach because that's the outcomes that they want um, in their life now not every single person is going to want me as their coach and that's okay and that's fine and it's okay to not be all to everybody because you're not going to be but what you want to do is make sure that you've got um the people that are coming to you are the clients that you would want to work with and that you would get enjoyment out of it and that's really really important so um i'm going to come on to the what i consider the elevator pitch and that thinking about your values so how do you apply your values um very very quickly so that people could um know that you're the right person for them um, and this is just very, these, this is not sort of what I've specifically got written on my website, but these were just examples that I wanted to, to share with you. So example one, and you see this on so many people's sites, I help people who feel stuck in a rut find clarity and purpose by offering one-to-one -one coaching sessions. Now, if you've been on some marketing courses, that, that is basically a line they give you and you fill the gaps in of the specific bits and this is what you come out with. So I help people who, da 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 buy da 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 da, da. Now, how, if, if everyone's got that on their website, who do you know, who do you know is the best person to go to? Where, where's your values in that? Where, where is your personality in that? So here's another alternative, and this is very, very extreme, but I work with professional women who feel held back in their careers to smash the glass ceilings and achieve world domination. After an intense six-week course, my course, my rockets can stage dive and crowd surf, surf into the next level of their awesomeness. Now, it says a lot more about who I would be as a coach if that was my marketing, because people, ew, there'll be people that'll go, yeah, not, in, not for me. And that's absolutely fine. But there'll be people that go, yeah, I want to be that. I want, I want my life to feel like a, like a rock show. I want to be able to do that. I want to achieve world domination. That is my goal. And therefore, um, that's who I would pick. So you'll have, you'll have some people who will love or hate example two, but nobody will love example one. And who's going to part with their, their money if they don't love something? Because you're not going to sit there and buy something that's kind of average, kind of okay. You're going to buy something because you really, really want it. Not because it's kind of okay. So I think that's really, really important um, that, to think about your language and to, and to convey who you are um, to, to your prospective clients. So this then brings me on to trust. If people like you, they'll listen to you. But if they trust you, they will do business with you. 
And there's three elements that I want to talk about in terms of trust um, and how this can help in your business. The first bit is trusting of yourself and not having any doubts. Um, if, you, if you want something enough, you can make it happen. And you've really got to ask yourself the question, is this something that you really, really want? And it goes back again to if the passion is not there, then you need to be having a rethink. So I, I, I want to share with you um, when I was uh, from the age of about 16 to 21, I was a professional actress and I did some um, TV um, jobs and, um, and I loved it, absolutely loved it. But a lot of people started putting doubts in and saying, you know, it's not a sustainable career. It's really, um, you know, you don't know when the next job's going to come in. You need a backup plan. So I spent all of my energy focusing on my backup plan. And because I was focusing on my backup plan, because I was doubting that I could be the next world famous actress, I didn't become the next world famous actress. And I lived my backup plan because my energy went into my backup plan because I didn't trust that I had the ability. I had fantastic opportunities that I could have really capitalized on, but I didn't trust that I could be the next famous actress and when you look at all of the people that are the, the the world famous actresses it's because they completely trusted that that is what they wanted to do and they went for it no matter what and I remember being sort of quite an impressionable 16 17 year old around some other famous actors on the shows that we worked on and they always used to say to me if you want it enough you can make it happen and I never understood that until it was too late until it was kind of I'd, I'd spent all this time on my backup plan and then I was doing what I was doing with my backup plan and then I thought you know what my energy has been in the wrong place so if this is something that you really want to do and you're absolutely convinced and you trust yourself and you're willing to work you know put your um all your energy into it this is something that you can make happen for yourself, but you've got to start understanding if there are doubts, if there are blocks, if it is starting to feel a little bit hard work, what is that that's stopping you? You have to start becoming the coach for yourself um, in order to be able to help you get through that. Um, I also, I mean, I, I, there was a lady that I used to um, coach. She was desperately, she said, oh, you know, I really want my own coaching practice. Um, not coaching counseling practice but I haven't got the skills to be able to set it up but she'd actually gone to work for a charity that didn't have a um that didn't have a counseling service and she was the counseling manager and she set up this whole counseling service from scratch NHS counseling service from scratch she'd done it all by herself but for some reason she didn't think she was capable of doing it and that you know that's the bit that you've got to really think about being able to trust yourself in being able to do this particular thing um, and also the thinking about um, when you trust yourself and when you when you can really really love it what you do you will just it, your business will just sell and like I talked to you about you know when people rang us up about the beautiful souls wellness retreat we were talking about it we were excited we were pumped and that's what sold the business not us doing a, a, a sales pitch it was because of our passion that sold that and I always talk, I, I, you know, I said right at the beginning about going back to um, paying attention to your own experiences. I always remember this lady called Sean, who I bought car insurance from. <laughs> and it's quite, it can be seen quite an unremarkable story, you know, the story of car insurance. But there was something that I really learned about um, Sean. So when I rang her up to talk about my car insurance, I'd previously run another company. The guy was really not interested and I put the phone down. And I didn't want my car insurance from him. But when I rang Sean, um, she was great. She seemed to really love her job. We had a chat. We were laughing. We were like cracking jokes with each other. And um, I bought my car insurance from her. And then she even managed to, in this conversation, I was then, I rang back four months later and got the house insurance and my partner's car insurance because she'd sold me this whole multi policy. So just by her, being passionate about her job, making the experience pleasant for me, what would have just been one £300 car insurance, she was actually a £1,000 worth of business that she got from us because we took all of our insurance to that company because of her. Because when she answered that phone, when she spoke to me, I felt I could trust her because she made that 
that was an important thing for me. So the other bit is about um, get, gaining trust for your business. So you've got to trust yourself, but you've also got to help get other people to trust you. And that becomes quite difficult when you think, well, how do I get out there to let people know that they can trust me? And this is about doing all of the things about making yourself visible online. And I talk about, um, you know, about you, you, you can write in blogs, um, you can um, do Facebook Live videos. And what I would say is don't overscript something because if you overscript it, it becomes back to that sort of polished website that might be very different to who you are in reality. Be yourself and don't apologize for being yourself. Um, just get yourself out there on, on social media and available to people because what will happen is if you're, if you're just being yourself, people will start to connect with you. And even if people stumble on your website first, they then might see all the articles that you've written and then they start thinking, yeah, she gets it, he gets it. That means that, that that's exactly what I need. So you're building a narrative around who you are as a person. What I would, would say, and I, I see this, and some people think it's a really good idea and that's great if that works for them. I don't particularly like it when people just put, I'm the leading expert in something and think that because they've put, I'm the leading expert, that creates trust. It might get you somebody through the door as your first paying client, but if you haven't got the proof in the pudding and that your, your, the delivery of your services isn't what they're expecting of you as the leading expert, you won't get booked again. And then how, how so you, what you might do is you might get a lot of firsts, but you won't get repeat business off the same people. And actually the best market, the, the, the people who are, who are genuinely the leading experts are the people that don't actually have to market themselves anymore because the proof is in their pudding, because they're so good at what they do that actually that it's word of mouth that does all their business for them. So they get referrals because one of their previous clients told somebody else who told somebody else and then they're, they're getting booking that way. I think that personally, my view is that if you are the leading expert, that is a title that should be given to you by your peers, not one that you decide to take upon yourself. Because if you were a doctor and if you were the leading expert in brain surgery, you wouldn't get that just by saying you're the leading expert in brain surgery. You get that because you've done a million and one um, uh, brain op surgeries on people and with really good success you've done that because you're a teacher and you've you've given back to the the business and you've done that because you're writing articles and that people are looking to you um, it's done that you've done that because you've done research you've done that because everybody else is looking to you because you're you're innovative and you're at the front of that so I think if you're going to say that the elite and expert you need to have been doing all of these things and I think because otherwise you're just going I see so many people saying I'm the lead of this and I'm the lead of that and I'm like prove it why why are you the why are you the lead person of that um so I I think stop that for me can I consider that to be a bit lazy marketing um and it won't like I say you, you won't get a sustainable business by doing that um the other thing about getting trust for your business is having good policies in place. And I know this is on a very practical level and it can seem probably to be a bit dull, but actually it's about good customer care. So if you've got, um, if you've got uh, your clients that are coming in and um, you've got good policies about how you would um, get them into the business that actually you, you share with them confidentiality policies, all of those kind of things, they're the things that will help build trust for your business. And I've secured clients just on the basis of having some of those things in place. So I remember speaking to a, a prospective new client and they'd had a really, really bad experience with um, a, a therapist that they'd employed um, and so actually what I was able to do is I was actually able to, to share with them that my certificates um, my complaints policy the um, how they could then be you know if they were dissatisfied with that who I was accredited by IAPC and M so how they could go to the IAPC and M if they were unhappy with something that that I'd specifically delivered. And so because I was able to do that and put all these assurances around the product that I was giving somebody, um, that was something that secured that business. I also picked up a client who was a solicitor 
and they just naturally expected all of that stuff to be there and it was there because I'd spent the time thinking about having the right policies in, in place to say to that client when they come along you are the most important thing here and this is what I am putting around you to make sure I'm safeguarding you and what you're buying from me so that I'm ensuring that you've got a good product and if you're not happy with the product you've got um, some uh, a way to come back from that so I think that's really 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 important on a very very practical level of something that you can have in place that provides the security for you and for your clients when they when you are booking them the other bit is about trust in the industry and this is where as coaches we all have to work together um, it can feel because it's kind of like a you know if you're in business on your own that actually you know are you competing with other people I'd say you know no we're all in this together we are all responsible for ensuring that the industry is um, is trusted and we're all responsible for ensuring that people respect coaching as a methodology to helping people and the reason why this is so important is because one or two or three um, examples of poor practice can really um, damage the trust in an industry. So, you know, at, at the time when Harold Shipman got arrested, you know, what did the public then start to think around of GPs, you know, because this is the, the huge thing around Harold Shipman was around that actually, um, and if people don't know who I'm referring to, is the GP who was a serial killer. But at the time, I mean, I, I know that's sort of, sort of quite extreme, but at the time, the GP was that one person that everybody felt that they could trust. And the moment when this became public, that people started asking the question of like, can I trust my GP? You know, what, what's gone on? You look at um, the, the really, really um, awful cases um, of missed abuse in children, um, baby P, um, those cases and what that did to the social work profession. I'm a social worker. So, you know, actually it became it became a. Um, a place where you didn't actually ever want to announce what you were qualified to do because of how people just mistrusted the profession um, that you know in terms of all the stuff that's happened with the um, American gymnastics and Larry Nasser who was the um, the physio so a lot of um, and what he was doing at you know misusing his position of power so actually by you have one two or three people that do you know that are sort of catastrophic it can really damage the industry what we have to do with that is make sure that we've got really good quality coaches and mentors in the industry that are raising the profile and the standards and in terms of thinking about coaching and people's the public trust in coaching as a as um a methodology for, for helping people with their with, with their goals is about how the experience of coaching in general so what I would say to people is form a network with other coaches other coaches around and then um, you know because what will happen is you will have clients that will come along and they will access co the coaching world via you but they might not be able to connect with you um, and you might think actually we no, we're not a right fit but if you were able to say to that person, no, I accept we're not a right fit, but I know exactly who's the perfect coach for you. Let me introduce you to my colleague over here. And then you make that introduction and they have a really good experience of coaching. What actually that does, that says a lot about you, but it also makes that person think about, you know, um, they've had a really good experience of coaching. So the industry of coaching, not just as an individual, but the industry of coaching. And if you form that network with people, and like I say, you know, if you look at my, my brand values, my glass ceiling smasher, my energy and all of that kind of thing, you know, not, that's not going to be suited for everybody, but somebody might, for some reason, come to me because they've been record someone else had recommended them but they might go do you know what she's just not for me but I could go yeah but I know who is the right person for you and put them in the right place because I've got that network of people around me and it also means that then other people might also be doing that to you as well so it's really important that we think about rather than people accessing just your coaching business how people are accessing the industry and what we can do to support each other with that and that can really help your business because if you're building building a network of people you're building other streams and avenues to bring in the business so 
to summarize, I just want to say to you, you know, you've got to know that you are good enough. You are capable and there is a place for you in this industry. I absolutely fundamentally believe in that. And I want to just sort of caveat that with that, that this is not always about people having an individual business and a six figure salary. It's about what does coaching and the world of coaching mean to you in terms of what you consider it a success. And that actually might be about being employed by somebody else and being a coach in the workplace for those individuals and being a brilliant coach and helping that company that you work for really succeed because of your coaching skills. It might be about you working individually it might be about you going into a car partnership business with somebody else. It might be about owning a big coaching company where you can actually put on your website, we and our, we're going to help you and our coaching packages, like my first iteration of my website. <laughs> so it might be all of those, you know, it, it means different things to different people. There is a place for everybody in the industry. So it's really important that you trust that you are good enough to do that. Um, where's me? cursor gone there it is okay trust in yourself that you are great and that you are going to be successful don't doubt yourself on this if you've gone and done your coaching courses and you've passed your coaching courses and you are accredited you have achieved and demonstrated the benchmarks that are required for being a good coach that is all that you need in the first instance to get things going so you need to trust that you are going to be successful if your first wave of marketing doesn't work, it's not a failure. It's a lesson to make you great. And I've shared with you, I mean, I've been doing this, I can't even remember how long now, about five or six years. These are the lessons and hopefully it won't take you five or six years. I've saved you certainly probably the first two years of my learning just by writing this chapter. Um, and I sat there waiting. I thought if I created a website, the phone would just ring. And then someone told me about search engine optimization. And I thought, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. So, um, so yeah, so please don't think if it doesn't work the first time or the phone doesn't ring straight away, just keep using it as an opportunity to learn. It's not a failure. It's a lesson to make you great. And then when you've got a load of lessons to make you great, write a book and let other people know about it because other people will be sitting there going, oh, I don't, I don't know what to do next with my business. So don't throw the towel in. Perhaps there's just something that needs tweaking. Perhaps it's just a rewording of your retreat website that will change it from no bookings to 11 full paid bookings. It was a simple change in language made a big difference for the success of that, um, the, of that retreat that we did. Keep revisiting your values until you know with absolutely certain that they are your true values. It's the, one of the very first things that you would probably do with a client. Do it with yourself. Do it again and again and again and keep testing it out because your values might change. Your direction of your business might change. Just keep checking that your values are there and make the values visible. Develop your own brand and lingo and voice to help you stand out from the crowd. That gives your business an identity and it makes you different. If you have the very sort of boring wording that everybody else has got, how, do, how are you able to be different? And you'll see in the book, if you've read it, there's loads of other people that um, in there. I think it, uh, Ruby talks about having dreamy clients. She's got her lingo. Um, Anna's got her lingo. Maria's got her. Everybody's got their own lingo that makes their business different from everybody else's. So you've got to really think about what's your brand lingo? How would you describe limiting beliefs? Do you call it limiting beliefs or do you call it about smashing your glass ceilings? It's the same principle, but it's your lingo. It's the thing that works for you. Keep that fire in your belly burning because if you are passionate about what you're doing, you will sell, 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 sell without even trying. And if the fire starts to go out, have a look again, revisit your values. What is it that you need to do differently? Um, it's not about you failing. I can't stress that enough. It's about things just need tweaking and changing and tweaking and changing. The, the world changes all the time and the needs of the world changes all the time. You all grow, you all evolve. So allow your business to grow and evolve with you. It doesn't have to be static. And they're the things that I think are the most important things that I would like you to take away from this session about how you can build the most successful business and sustainable business for you. So finally, two um, things that I always say, anything is possible. Okay, absolutely anything is possible. If you want it enough, you can make it happen. And the last bit, 
Dawn always talks about this um, when we have a conversation, but do what you're doing and add 10%. Always add 10% on because when you add 10% on, you'll get to where you need to go quicker than you would have done if you didn't have the 10%. So do what you're doing and add 10%. There is one caveat with that. Don't apply it to eating chocolate because that won't do you any favours whatsoever. So just eat your normal amount of chocolate, not 10% extra of chocolate. Okay, so um, they, they are the main things that I would just like to say in terms of um, capturing the main points of my chapter. Um, I have got in there a number of exercises that will help you um, bring out your values, help you get your voice in terms of if you know if you're writing blogs and things. There's some really good exercises in there. Things that people had taught me. Um, I can now write a blog very very quickly because of the uh, the 10 minute writing exercise that's in my um, chapter. So I hope that's helpful. Um, and I hope to hear all about your businesses growing and booming and, um, and being the best that they can be um, in the future. Thank wow. you. Thank you, Adele. You can pause and, and take a deep breath now. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you can certainly hear and feel the energy by the pitch and the pace. Uh, and the language and, and the fun that's very important to you in a way that wouldn't come across in the written world. Uh, and that's why these calls have been so important for the uh, magnificent seven authors who wrote this wonderful book to bring their chapter to life. And in fact, um, uh, Charlotte has written to say, wow, thank you so much, Adele. I just read your chapter last week, so it's wonderful to hear it come to life today. Really needed to hear this, so thank you. Um, Desmond said it's a Fantastic. great presentation. Uh, thank you, Adele. At what point in your initial discussion with a potential client do you reference uh, or show confidentiality policy, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I, I mean, I sort of do it fairly early on. I mean, once we've done the established, you know, I talk through what the process of the coaching would be. Um, and if people are, are making um but because they're asking all the questions if, if they've never been in coaching before um i think that's um firstly I, I then talk about the process of what coaching is first um if they have been in coaching then i would move a bit quicker to that but i would talk about um i that for me it's one of the key elements of what you know when you're talking about price when you're talking about number of sessions when you talk about i i bring confidentiality in straight away because it's it's about how does that space how is that space going to feel safe for somebody so when um somebody's coming to you they're coming to you with a problem and and it's a problem that they've been thinking about for a long long time and it's a problem it's something that they want to change and that can be very scary for an individual so the first thing to do is make them feel safe within that space that so actually yes it's possible we can sort this out um, and but we're going to do this in a very safe way and it's not going to be scary and then actually it's going to be really really good fun so i would bring it in right at the beginning with that conversation as we're fond of saying at the iapcnm contracting very first stage, so important for the rest of the journey. Um, uh, Anna has said, uh, I'm afraid I need to go Adele. Uh, it's been great to be reminded of your wise words. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Ulias, it's very nice model Adele. Thank you for sharing the information and putting in all this great work. Iona says, thank you, great energy, very valuable information, thank you. So please, you know, um, either put your questions in the chat box or unmute yourself. But I mean, for me, uh, and I've been coaching for nearly 20 years, Adele, this was so opportune um, because I'm just creating a new website and I'm thinking, hmm, what's my message? How does, this, <laughs> how does this actually sit with all my other social media platforms? They're all slightly different. They're all, because this is a brand new product. So I need to actually think about my language and that consistency of message. Um, which, as you say, is quite important. I love the bit when you were talking about the expert. Of course, we, you know, especially published authors, uh, we all want to think of ourselves as, as experts and, and having a published book does give you that perception. But you just think of a, a stroll through the airport uh, and you see all the bookshops. Everyone's an international bestseller. Can't be true. Not everybody can be. So, you know, know your own limitations uh, and be honest. Uh, that's where the authenticity yep. comes in. And yes, you're absolutely right. We're all ambassadors for the industry. So I, I, I agree with uh, everything you said. It was a fantastic presentation. So very well done. 
So questions, please. Who would like to uh, ask Adele something while we have her in the hot seat? Because as we know, she's a very busy, busy practitioner in the NHS. I'm going to ask Adele a question that I get asked a lot because I'd like to hear Adele's take on it. Hello, Adele. Oh, yeah, you're um, I love the hour, actually. I, I know I had my camera off for most of it. It was because I was having a late lunch after finishing with a client at two o'clock. So I'm glad I managed to cut him off before I saw you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a question I get asked a lot, um, particularly by new coaches who are maybe testing the water in maybe two or three different niches, which yeah. may have a completely different audience, completely different language. How would you approach reconciling that so it's always them showing up authentically as themselves mm -hmm. whilst also making sure they speak in the right way to the right audience i i think there's i mean when i first started it I, it was very clear i was told find your niche find your niche really really niche it down make it so so niche and um and i sort of started out going right okay um actually for, for me sort of how people relate are really really important and the, and the relationships but I was like no I'm going to niche this down so much to divorce so I'd niche so much because everyone had told me to niche but actually I wasn't in love with the idea of being a divorce coach and that's how I started and I think there's something and, and I gradually just started migrating out of it so I think if you're not if you're not hook line and sinkered passion into your niche I'd get rid of it. I think sometimes when people try and have lots of niches because they don't know where to go, I would say spend the time working out on the thing that makes your heart sing first. Because I think what people do when they try and niche in different places is that's where they're doubting themselves because they're thinking, oh, well, I might get more money here or I might get more clients or what about that? And actually where I ended up in the end is probably quite far removed from divorce coaching but it's the stuff that really really drives me on and spurs me on and it's the stuff that I become more and more excited about and it you know and so I think that's what I would say to people is try not to but by having lots of different niches they end up diluting what it is that they're doing and go for the thing that you, that you have your head and your heart thing so your head will be oh I should do that because that's where the money is but where's your passion go with, I'd go with your passion all the time because I think that those kind of things you, you, if you're passionate about something you don't have to sell it because it will just you'll sell it anyway you won't have to think about a sales script because you're so passionate about it when people ring up and they want to book you 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 don't you just you just tell them because that's the thing that you love that would be my my take on it and in fact probably uh, similar to what you'd say Nikki probably <laughs> and in fact, you mentioned the other authors, uh, Maria, who wrote the heart-led marketing chapter. She talks about that, doesn't she, Adele, that uh, if yeah. you're passionate and you're authentic, uh, whether you're talking to somebody in the queue at the cinema uh, or sat next to somebody on a bus, you're having a heartfelt conversation. Those are the sorts of people who become your clients because they're yep. relaxed, they trust you. Uh, rather than, you know, necessarily at a chamber of commerce with the business card, right, this is who I am, this is what I do, how quickly can we make a sale? It's not that at all. Um, yeah. I've never heard anybody talk about heart-led selling the way that I have with heart-led marketing until recently when I met um, a, a lovely gentleman called Scott, and he's going to be one of our speakers in May at International Coaching Week because the whole week is going to be dedicated to sales. Uh, but how do you do it in a heart-led way that doesn't feel like a, a sale? Because we're in the business of having a conversation and selling is just a conversation. It's not something mm -hmm. that you do uh, or, or have to remember to do. It's, it's just all the sort of common sense stuff that we as coaches know. It's listen, it's ask questions, ask open questions, yep. etc. I've got a colleague of mine who actually built an entire really, really successful training business without marketing anything, without a website, without a business card. And she did all of that just because she was a, she was a part, she worked part time and her role was as, um, as a trainer, but she was so good at it and she was so passionate about it that the companies then would say, would you do some bespoke stuff? So she would do some be bespoke stuff separately so she just ended up getting requests after request after request because she was so great and she had no business card and she had no website and they the, the business card and the website has come after after so she's full time into that and she has a lovely life she's always posting pictures of herself on holiday so um she's having a great life 
with, with that, but that's because she's passionate about it. She loves it and it sells itself. Mm -hmm. So. Well, they do say it's uh, 10 times cheaper uh, or, or rather it's 10 times more expensive to go and look for a new client on marketing costs than it is to keep your existing clients happy. So just keep mm. talking to them uh, and keep doing the sort of customer relationship uh, things that you did when you first booked them as uh, yep. a customer. Remember their birthday, share posts that would interest them with their um, hobbies or their business uh, that you think they'll be interested in. So it's really important and that's why we put it in the book, how to win clients and keep them. It's, uh, it's a bit like uh, you know writing a book. Anybody can write a book, but not many people finish the book. So it's all of those sorts of uh, big pictures, yes. stuff, isn't it? Any yes. other questions while we've got Adele, please, before we wrap up? Nikki, did you want to say something else? Um, yeah, it wasn't so much a question. It was more just highlighting one of the things that Adele had said when you were um, um, talking about um, proving your worth and referrals and recommendations and introductions and I think sometimes um, if I talk to coaches or if I'm networking with other coaches and they say well how do you source clients I hear coaches feeling or sounding almost apologetic that most of their new client work comes through introductions via existing clients than the referrals network and word of mouth it's almost sort of I apologize that I only get stuff through word of mouth because they that maybe there's a sense that Perhaps we, we feel we ought to be doing <clears throat> excuse me, a whole load of other marketing activity as well. And, um, and I loved what Adele said that, that actually those introductions and word of mouth connections are the proof that you, are, that you do what you do. People will introduce you because they value what you have Absolutely. done for them. And so actually, yeah. I think as coaches, we need to be um, celebrating the fact that most of our work comes through introductions because that's um, that's the proof of the credibility of, of what we deliver so um, I, I like that when you highlighted that <laughs> <laughs> I've just put in the chat box a, a quote that I think you uh, will like um, you charge more because you are worth it oh, sorry you charge more because you are worth more or you are worth more because you charge more you have to keep mm. reading that over and over until you realize, ah, that's the one that's for me. That's a great, great quote. But I, I think it's I think it's really good for one of the, the biggest things is to really get a good connection, um, a good network of um, peers around you that you can connect with. You can even collaborate. That's what happened with our retreat. Me and another coach collaborated. We've passed clients to each other. And I think that's really, really important to do that because um, then, you, you know, you, you know, you're you're getting the best for the client, even if you're not the direct coach that's doing that. You're ensuring that they get the best outcome. Yeah, because we outlive our coaches as well. You don't have the same coach for the whole of your life. You have different coaches for different things sometimes. So you have a good first experience. Then you're going to be happy with most people in the coaching industry who are properly trained insured, professionally accredited, etc. Yeah, good point. Okay, so I'm conscious of the time uh, and um, I just want to give everybody a last opportunity if you want to say anything. Uh, if not, perhaps we'll just have 60 seconds quiet to think about our CPD and either put it in our CPD log or in the chat box. What are the key takeaways that you're going to take uh, from Adele's wise words today. So 60 seconds starting now, share if you wish to.
Okay. Good. Well, if anybody needs a CPD form, uh, they can contact us and uh, we will send you one. But um, otherwise, stay safe. We've got plenty more webinars uh, coming up for the rest of the year. So we'll see you again. And uh, Adele, how can people contact you if they want to work with you um, or uh, buy your book? You're on mute. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> so um, there's my website, northhousecoaching.com, um, and I can be contacted on there or through the IAPCNM. Brilliant. And the book is on Amazon. Yep. Okay. Yes. So the book is on Amazon. Hopefully, you've um, if you've not got a copy, um, uh, otherwise, um, yeah, Amazon's the best place to get it. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Stay safe. Bye bye now. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.